Okay. So tonight, um, we have our next uh, set of group Zoom presentations. And we have about five groups who will be uh, doing the presentation in relation to the uh, group discussion assessment. And um, I'd like to remind the groups that you are given a time limit of 12.5 minutes each. That's for each group. So you have to make sure that you adhere to the time limits, mainly because we have five groups presenting tonight. In fact, if we allow the fifth group, which might likely be the Fantastic Four, to present tonight as well, we will have to spill over uh, past 7 o'clock. And that can be problematic for me because I've got another tutorial coming up at 7.15. So please make sure to uh, st stick to your time limits, and I'm going to closely monitor the way that the groups have been using their time. Now, having said that, uh, we should probably be ready to proceed. Now, the way I look at this, uh, in terms of order, I'd like to begin uh, by allowing the groups to present according to the alphabetical order of uh, the group name. So we'll begin with the Army group, then we have the Barangaroo group, the Barker Ghani group, and then we have the Give Us Our Guns, and the Fantastic Four will just come in a bit later, mainly because they were not originally meant to be presenting tonight, so there had to be a, uh, a request to reset the original uh, presentation time for them. So that's the reason why the Fantastic Four will be presenting till last, if um, Michael and his group would be ready by then. So having said that, um, will there be any questions? Well, what did about Kat? Did you... You, did you include cats in that? Oh, no. Okay. So oh, no. Steve, yeah. <laughs> was Steve Cat going to be presenting as well tonight? Okay. Now, we can do that. Um, so there has been some mix up. I did expect that there would potentially be six groups doing the presentation tonight. So my main problem is that I have another tutorial at 7.15 and I've got groups presenting there as well. So as far as the team cat is concerned or okay instead of dealing with team cat the question is which group would be willing to have its presentation tonight move to another week or because otherwise we could do the presentation but it has to come after my uh, public international law tutorial so we've got that option we could still do it but it has to be after uh my public international law tutorial group army are you Hmm? Manjo, considering no one else from the group, from my groups here as of yet, um, well, I think we'd obviously be happy to, to do it next week. Uh, who's Me and Alana are here. Hang on, who's speaking? I could, I, who was that speaking? Was that Michael? Oh, yeah, it was. Sorry. From, from okay, Facebook. okay. It's, it's not easy for me to know who's talking. Okay, Mike. Yeah. Go on. Who was that? I'm to jump in. Um, We've just had some issues with our group with people just coming home from work and things like that. Uh, you suggested a group to do next week. Uh, which group might that be? Uh, we're the Barkagani group. Ah, so you want to delay yours. Okay. Because of work and unfortunately, uh, it just worked out that way. Okay. Um, that shouldn't be a problem. I don't think that'll be a problem. Yep. So I'm happy to reset that mainly because we have too many people presenting tonight. So. Um, no we will have the presentations for the following groups. We've got the Army group, the Barangaroo. Hang on, no, not the Army group. We're resetting it, right? So we're going to have the Barangaroo group, Give Us Our Guns, Team Cat, and Fantastic Four. Okay? In that order. So Barangaroo, Give Us Our Guns, Fantastic Four, and then the Team Cat. Would that be good? Would that, is that okay? Yep, that would be perfect. Okay, then. So can we begin uh, by asking the... Um, Barangaroo group to begin its uh, presentation. I'm going to stop sharing now to enable uh, the Barangaroo group to do its screen sharing. Uh, where's the Barangaroo group? Do we have Do we have anyone from the brand group? Who's that? Who would they be? We're We're here, man, Joe. I think we're just uh, just bringing it up now. Okay, thank you, Joe. You've got it. Is Nathan here? He is. Oh, okay. I think Nathan's got it. 
He was. He was on his phone. All right. Well, look. Let's let's crack on. I don't want to. I don't want to waste mm. time unnecessarily. Uh, okay. I will screen share. There we go. Okay. We're up. I think we're running. Yeah, we could see that. Okay, beautiful. Okay, sorry, I've just got to go back to the start now. I was uh, sort of expecting to start somewhere in the middle, so we'll, we will crack on. So uh, we're, we're the uh, Barangaroo Group. We're looking at the uh, legal challenge from the Millers Point Fund, um, which is, uh, we'll get into the, uh, the parties uh, downstream uh, against the, a group of uh, bodies um, who were responsible for a planning permission for the new Crown Casino development uh, in Sydney. So that, uh, that started off in August of this year. Um, the, uh, proceedings were brought in the Land and Environment Court uh, against a group of companies, uh, the Minister for Planning and also the uh, Planning and Assessment Commission, uh, which is a statutory body um, that advises the Minister. Um, so they were seeking a judicial review of a modification to a planning permit which was given uh, to the uh, Barangaroo uh, organisation uh, to develop the new Crown Casino in the area. The Millers Point Fund, uh, it's a community organisation uh, which is challenging the construction. We'll just run through the, uh, the parties to it now. Planning and Assessment Commission, it's statutory body, body advising the Minister for Planning uh, that's established under the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act of 1979 for New South Wales. But the other the other parties, um, Lend, Lease, Lend Lease, Millers Point, uh, it's a group of organisations. Uh, in, it includes the Crown Group. Uh, it includes the, uh, the Minister for Planning and the uh, Planning and Assessment Committee. So we'll just run through a timeline of the uh, the events leading up to the leadership uh, the uh, the cha legal challenge. Um, back in 20, 2007, the concept plan for the whole of Barangaroo received uh, ministerial approval. We then uh, we then move on six years, and uh, an, an amendment to the Casino Control Act was passed in uh, in two thousand and thirteen, and that set licensing parameters for a proposed casino which hadn't received. Uh, planning approval at that stage. <clears throat> uh, in that uh, in that uh, amendment, uh, there were uh, there was a, uh, a designation of uh, of a land area which uh, a license was granted to. And we move along. 2016, uh, another another uh, three years on, the eighth modification to the Barangaroo uh, concept accept plan was uh, approved by the planning minister. Uh, and uh, that was following advice from the Planning and Assessment Commission. That, uh, that modification moved the Crown Casino uh, Hotel Resort development from a, effectively a, a, a little recovered island in the, uh, the harbour back onto an area which had previously been uh, set aside for, uh, for community parkland. Okay, so in 2016, in August, uh, Millers Point Fund brought a legal action against the, uh, the Development uh, Corporation and others uh, in the Land and Environment Court. Uh, this went to a hearing on the uh, 15th and 16th of November and a judgment came out on the 23rd of December about that. So the case they were making. The, the main challenge was that uh, when the uh, Planning Assessment Committee uh, gave approve or gave, advised the minister to approve the eighth modification of the plan. Um, they cited the Casino Control Act, the one licensing the new casino development. You uh, have four been... minutes to go, Nick. For four time. minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll ra we'll race on. Um, so that was cited as their their main uh, uh, main decision making thing. The challenge was based on the. Uh, enabling legislation for the uh, the Planning Assessment Committee uh, as being the Environmental Protection Act and not the Casino Control Act, uh, and the challenge was made that that shouldn't uh, shouldn't go ahead, and that it's an error of law to consider the Casino Control Act, not just the Environmental Protection Act. 
Um, so we can uh, just see up there very quickly. I'll try and move along as rapidly as possible. Now, as judicial re review was sought, um, the Land and Environment Court does both a judicial and an administrative uh, review function. Uh, we can talk to that uh, if anyone has any, any further questions. Okay, uh, governing legislation, as we've discussed, um, it's, it's slightly different in New South Wales from, uh, from the rest of the country. Uh, we're covered under the uh, Uniform Civil Procedure Rules uh, for commencing judicial review. There is less of the, uh, it's, it's a codification rather than uh, going on some of the common law uh, things. Okay, so there's challenges available under the EPA Act, a statutory uh, provision there. And uh, we've got this. Uh, we've got this available. I'll share the um, presentation in the chat as well, if anyone wants to uh, uh, refer on to that. Um, we've just made some co uh, comparison with uh, federal cases and looking at how uh, we would change that if it went to the federal court. And we had to go under the AG, AJDR Act. Judgment came out. Sorry, 23rd of December. Um, it was found that uh, there was there was no case, uh, and it uphold held the uh, the development consent uh, giving uh, given to the eighth modification of the plan. Um, a quote there from Justice Robertson, uh, Rob Rob Son, who heard the case, uh, and he uh, he considers that uh, the correct legal uh, principles were applied, and there was no error of law. Questions, please. Thank you. I was actually expecting somebody else from your group to be uh, making some statements as well. Uh, we were as well. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you've got a two more minutes. Are you ready to, for, for, you, for me to give my feedback as well as ask some questions or what? Uh, I'll just see if Nathan has reappeared. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here now. I've, oh, I've yeah. had some shortfalls in my connectivity there and it just all flunked out at about 6.50. Uh, <laughs> nothing else to add. And, I'm ready for some feedback and questions, I suppose. Sorry about that. I was supposed to present the sort of first half of that. Ah. Um, so would anyone from the group wish to add anything? Uh, just that Nick did a really good job on the spot then. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much, Nick. It's military training. <laughs> okay. So you, um, I could take over now? Thanks. Yes, please. Okay. So let me begin by providing the feedback. As you noticed, um, you will be you're being evaluated for this assessment on the basis of four criteria, organization, content, uh, the presentation, as well as the response to questions. In terms of the organization, I uh, see that the group uh, was very well organized in terms of presenting the, um, the issues, as well as the factual background. Uh, so the content uh, was quite comprehensive and it was presented in a very uh, interesting manner. Uh, the presentation was also done in a very uh, natural pace, not, and uh, Nick obviously did speak quite fast, so we were able to pick up uh, the key points of what he said. So having said that, I would definitely highly rate the group uh, in relation to the uh, group Zoom presentation. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, ask some questions in relation to uh, the presentation, but before I do that, would anyone from the class, would anyone from the class uh, wish, uh, Nick, there's a comment from Jessica for you to stop presenting, uh, start with the sharing. Would anyone else in the class wish to make any comments or ask any questions in the meantime, before I say anything else? No? Okay. Now, there was a uh, something that seems to be missing here, uh, Nick, and um, this concerns the local standing of uh, Miller's Point. What's the legal standing of uh, Miller's point here. Why is it allowed to be the aggrieved in, the, in these proceedings? Uh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a statutory provision there uh, within the EPA Act that allows a person that doesn't agree with it, a consent, consent authority's decision uh, to then uh, challenge that decision in a in in the court, that being the Land Environment Court. That's the statutory provision, uh, but also it, the the same uh, administrative law principles apply that have been uh, sort of developed through common law, and and that is that the error the error in law principle or that that principle that rule. 
Oh, that's that's this, Danny. Okay, so let, let's just clarify the statutory provision. Are you saying that there is a provision in that specific law that anyone, regardless of whether that person actually has any pecuniary or material interest or any legal interest in the case, can actually file uh, an application with a court? Uh, they have to, I can't remember the exact wording, they have to have an interest in it and they just have to file it within three months of that decision. I see. It's, so it's, what it's called, the, uh, called the neighbourhood rule. So you, uh, need to be, you need to live in a, in a neighbouring area to be able okay. to raise, uh, raise a, uh, a challenge within three months. So that's the legal standing of Miller's point. Very good. Okay, so that was not apparent in the factual background. That's good. Now, secondly, when I went through the factual background, uh, there was a statement in your factual background which said that that court does not review the merits of the decision, only the legality of the decision. And yet, in the course of your presentation tonight, tonight, Nick, you then made a statement that the court can also review matters uh, concerning merits. So which one is it? The Land Environment Court can conduct merit reviews. It doesn't just conduct judicial reviews, but in this particular matter, it's a judicial review. The actual merit review, review process needs to be, uh, ap the application for that to the court needs to be within a shorter time frame. Okay. I'll stop my head. I think, I think it's around a month possibly. So wh uh, whether or not that was a factor in this being a judicial review rather than a merits-based review, but the Land Environment Court can do both. But in this particular matter, we just wanted to highlight that it's, that this process to the judicial review and, and this is the appropriate. Uh, very good. So that's a very good answer. Um, so in other words, that there was the way that your statement was written in the factual background uh, gave the correct, incorrect impression that the court couldn't do both. Uh, which, and um, so in relation to that, how, how can a, and I'm just curious, how, how is it possible, if you look at the federal court system, it's not allowed, it's not permissible for any federal court to actually undertake merits review. And that's primarily because of the separation of powers. How is it that a uh, state court can do both, um, you know, a review of uh, the legality of a decision as well as its merits? Any reason for this? Um, Major, the, um, the court also employs uh, uh, commissioners who are subject matter experts in their planning or architecture or heritage uh, environmental <laughs> matters. Um, and they're able to conduct the, the merits review. But then there's also the legal arm to it, uh, which allows for well, a, a my question is how, Why is it that that is allowed in uh, the state system, but it's impermissible in the federal court system? So in the federal court system, a federal court cannot undertake a merits review because uh, that will violate the uh, partial separation of powers in the federal court, in the, in the Commonwealth system. How is it that in state courts, in the particular case of New South Wales, that court can uh, undertake both a review of the legality of a decision as well as the merits of the decision. Well, off, the, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm, I don't have an, an exact answer. I, I would say it has something to do with the lack of the availability for tribunals that handle this matter on, uh, state, on a state level. Um, okay. Well, the, the, the reason for that is that there is no separation of powers actually at the level of states. So it is permissible for any state court to both um, have uh, you know, the power to review on the basis of law as well as on the basis of merits. Because when a court, for example, attempts to review the factual correctness of a decision, that it actually encroaches in a sense into uh, the, the executive powers of government. And that is not allowed in the federal court system, but because there is no separation of powers in states, that's the reason why you can do that in New South Wales as well as in any other state, including, for example, in Queensland, uh, through the QCAP, where, it, where state courts can both um, examine the legality as well as the factual correctness of any decision. Okay, very good. Well done. So thank you very much. And um, so well done, group. You did really well. Thank you. Um, I'd like now to uh, proceed to the next group. And we have the Give Us Our Guns. Thank you. Thank you for this assessment, I'm the nominated speaker for the uh, presentation. The question and answer, if they come, will be open for all the rest of the group members. All right, good evening, learned friends, and of course our host, Dr. Manjo Oyson. 
to start off, I'd like to pose a question to all of you. Do any of you know anybody who's owned a firearm? Uh, do they have any difficulty acquiring their firearms license? Firearms ownership is governed by the Weapons Act of 1990 in the state of Queensland. Uh, if one takes notice of the mainstream media, it would appear that firearms ownership has not been inhibited by a legislative framework. Uh, however, the debate on gun ownership seems every bit as topical as it was the days after the Port Arthur massacre. The current laws have caused various issues for firearms owners, specifically farmers who are known as primary producers for the purpose of legislation. The uh, restrictions around obtaining a Category H license have negatively affected the ability of farmers to protect their properties from feral pests, destroying their crops and livestock. Feral pests are responsible for approximately $720 million worth of damage annually to farming operations, resulting in significant financial losses within the agricultural industry. Now moving on to slide three here, which is the beginning of our factual background. Uh, Mr. Shaxon, the aggrieved party in our situation and the subject of our factual background, is a primary producer who currently holds a category A, B and C firearms license. And he's been refused a category H license irrespective of his occupational reasons as a primary producer, in his case, feral pest eradication. Mr. Saxon was not excluded under Section 10B of the Weapons Acts of 1990, which is the basis for the fit and proper person test for firearms licensing. Over a period of 18 months, Mr. Shaxon has trapped 60 feral dogs on his property in northern Queensland. In 2013, Mr. Shaxon underwent major hip surgery due to a feral animal attack occurring in Mr. Shaxon tripped on rough terrain. Due to him not being able to work, Mr. Shaxon has suffered major financial loss, equating to around $50,000 in the 2014-2015 financial year. Uh, due to Mr. Saxon's current circumstances, outsourcing pest control to external contractors has not been an option. He simply can't afford to pay for their services. These issues have also affected other prime producers throughout Queensland who have been injured or are currently affected financially by feral pests. Moving on to the second part of our factual background, according to AgForce, an organisation representing rural farmers, damage incurred by feral pests consuming stock feed may amount to as much as $600 per day per animal. This problem has resulted in farms going bankrupt as they are not able to financially sustain their properties. The increase in feral pests has allowed them to propagate dangerously close to national parks. It is also a well-known fact that wild boars are known to have a propensity for attacking people. So this is, is a concern. The continuing increase in feral animals in farming areas is a result of primary producers not being able to get a hold of the weapons they need or a lack of support by the executive government to eradicate feral pests from their properties. Now moving on to our issues page, the issue of Category H firearms falls under the discretion of the Queensland Police Service Weapons Licensing Department, who interpret the Weapons Act of 1990 in the execution of their duties. As a result of their discretion, the Queensland Police Service has adopted a broad interpretation of the legislation. This broad interpretation of the Weapons Act of 1990 has resulted in farmers struggling to get the firearms required for the ethical eradication of feral pests on their properties. Due to their remote locations, in some instances, farmers do not have the luxury of free legal services or advice to key legal resources to assist them. There are no legal aid officers out on the sticks, for example. Uh, this issue is represented in the circumstances of Mr. Shaxon, the subject of the factual background, whose difficulties bring attention to the severity of the issue of pest control for primary producers in Queensland. Rule of law issues continued. The Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, often shortened to QCAT, is a merit review body that can make decisions within the same legal framework as the primary decision maker. Section 142, subsection 2 of the QCAT Act permits a review of the decision. Specifically, Section 147, subsection 1 of the QCAT Act provides a criterion of consideration by way of fact or a question of mixed law and fact. Section 11 of the Weapons Act of 1990 outlines the genuine reasons for possession of a weapon. These are sports target shooting, recreational shooting, an occupational requirement, including an occupational requirement for rural purposes, which is the case in our discussion. Um, 
Another one is the collection and preservation and study of weapons, and of course, another reason for prescribing the legislation as far as discretion goes by the QPS. There is no distinction regarding the different types of categories as per section 11, a firearm is simply a firearm. This position is reiterated by section 54 of the, of the Weapons Act of 1990. The notion of a distinction is born out of administrative decisions. To access a weapons license, applicants must fit the requirements set out in Section 10B of the Weapons Act of 1990. Uh, Section 10B outlines the rules for a fit and proper person, which considers the mental and physical health of the person on balance of public interest. The authorising body, the Queensland Police Service, Benjamin, you has a to go. How much? Two minutes. Thank you. The authorising body of the Queensland Police Service Weapons Licensing Department has the authority to review Category H weapons licence to current producers for best eradication purposes. This is in view of also the uh, Category H not being distinct as far as the other sections go. The Queensland Police Service has the delegated power under Section 15 of the Weapons Act to approve or revoke a licence. The applicants may appeal the appeal the decision of the Weapons Licensing Bureau via merits review process through QCAT. This is achieved by way of review of the factual issues and the decision of the determining officer under Section 142 of the Weapons Act of 1990. So in conclusion, which is the final slide here, the QPS administration of the Weapons Act has put undue restrictions on farmers wishing to obtain Category H weapons for occupational purposes. Uh, basically, the executive has created an obstacle for farmers by the administrative decision-making process. However, the merits review process via QCAT presents an opportunity to rectify the situation. Floor is back to you, Major. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, so I'm going to give my feedback now. Uh, I, I think that the organization and the presentation as well uh, were done uh, very well. So the pace of the presentation and the amount of uh, content that was given, I'd rate, that, I'd rate them very, very highly. So Benjamin, you did a good job in doing the presentation. Of course, uh, in consultation with your group, you did quite well. The only concern I have relates to the uh, part of the content, and this is the same problem that the first group faced uh, when they failed to talk about the local standard wheeler's point. But it appears to me that uh, in terms of the content, you did not really highlight what the administrative position was and what the basis for the rejection was. And I'll be asking a question along this line. So I think those two points, because we're dealing with an administrative law matter here, there should have been a discussion of what exactly was the administrative law decision, what the administrative decision was, and uh, what exactly was the basis for the rejection. That wasn't too clear to me. So having said that, can you just enlighten the class? What was the basis for the rejection of uh, Mr. Shaxon's application? I think it was just well, what you said in the first two paragraphs, but after that, you didn't talk, say anything about the, the specific case of Mr. Shaxon. Well, in this cir these circumstances, Saxon made the application for the weapon for feral pest eradication, and the QCAT basically came to the decision that he didn't have grounds to have this, have this weapon and it wasn't really necessary. During the process, they disregarded his concerns about safety and also the injuries he's had. This was born out of the original decision made by the Queensland Police Service. He went to QCAT to appeal and they reaffirmed the decision. Okay. It's our view that he now has grounds to go forward and appeal this decision within the tribunal. Okay, we need to go back to the original decision maker because that is the administrative decision. Yes. Okay. What was the basis for the rejection by the original decision maker of Mr. Shackson's application? That was the original the decision. Well, the Queensland Police Service who made the original decision of unfettered discretion in this matter in regards to the act. They judged that Mr. Shackson had not satisfied the criteria. Now, this is this is this was important for the discussion because, as far as Section 10 B is B was required. There was no criminal intelligence suggested that he was an unfit person. He had never been convicted of any crime involving a firearm. They had simply given him a category A, B and C license. And then when it came to the category H, they claimed he had not met the criteria. So let me, let me uh, ask a further question then. 
if it is the view of the original decision maker, meaning I think it's a Queens, the Queensland police that you had mentioned, if it was the view of the original decision maker that Mr. Shackson did not meet the criteria for, to, in order to hold a license for a gun, what would be the basis for any review, either by a court or by the QCAT? Because you already had a gun license for three other categories. They haven't been consistent in the way they have applied their ruling. Well, He's got the license category A, category B, and category C. When it comes to category H, they have suddenly decided that he no longer fits the criteria. Well, this is the doing... I mean, does it, does it mean that just because somebody has been, been given a license for three firearms, he could then have licenses for as many as even 10? There's no law to suggest this. As far as Section 11 of the Weapons Act was, is, is concerned, a firearm is a firearm for the purpose of the act. They are creating this distinction by their own discretion. Okay. It's not supported by the, tech, by the text of the Act. Now, if the original decision makers actually granted the discretion to refuse the grant of a license, meaning it's discretionary, and the decision maker exercises you know, the, the power to decide by using his discretion, what is the basis for any review of such a decision? if the decision is exercised according to law. It was manifestly unfair, and when making the, making the decision, I did not consider his submissions. Now, we've gone to, now, now in this process, we've suggested he goes to QCAT, he has gone to QCAT and not got satisfaction. They have once again ignored his submissions and not allowed him to submit evidence to support his, his situation. Now, in this case, the person who did, who did make the decision, amended it, sorry, rather in QCAT, was not a judicial member. Therefore, the appeal must take within the tribunal and we do not have an option of judicial review here. This is not a question of law. This is a question solely on fact, which is permissible within, within the QCAT Act. We have the option of applying under Section 147, either on a question of mixed law and fact or fact alone. Very good. Thank you very much. That was very persuasive. Thank you, Benjamin, and thank you to the group. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, well done. I'd like now to move on to the next group. So we've got two groups doing really well tonight. Um, so that puts a burden on the next two groups, or three groups even. Can I now give the floor to the Fantastic Four, if they are ready? I thought the Fantastic Four were delayed. Oh, were they? Meaning they're going to do it next week, next week, was it? Well, unless there's somebody from there who says otherwise, I thought that was the one, ah, one okay. of the two that deferred. Thank you for correcting me on that, Tony. Um, can Thank I you. give the floor now to Team Cat? Ah, you see, I just wanted to get on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can um, I please take over the screen, Manjo? Yes, please. Go ahead. All right. Uh, where's it gone? Up oh, there. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. This is Team Cat. I'm Karen Longhurst, and along with Tony Birch, Amanda Graham, and Megan Sheppen, we will be presenting tonight on the Week Three Merit Review and Administrative Tribunals topic of when is an injury the employer's responsibility when sustained in the course of employment. Every day, people undertake activities in the course of their employment. They travel to and from their place of work, travel from one place of work to another. Some lucky people get to have overnight trips for work and quite often people live on their employer's premises in the instance of fly-in, fly-out workers in remote locations. Employees also undertake activities which are not necessarily part of their general work, but which are supported by their employer. For example, Christmas parties, sporting activities, sponsored golf days and that sort of thing. When employees are injured in the course of their employment, there's usually a process already in place to make a claim. It's when the employer doesn't support the claim that problems arise, and that is what we have with Ms Bunter, who forms our case study. Ms Bunter works for a Commonwealth department and plays softball at lunch times in the work team. The department gives significant support and assistance to the team and quite often senior managers will attend the games. Miss Bunter broke her thumb playing in the softball semi-final. 
As a consequence of her injury, she's out of pocket for expenses and she also had to take leave without pay when her sick leave ran out. An incident report was completed on the day of the accident and her treating doctor provided her with a medical certificate. Ms Bunter supplied that certificate as part of her claim for compensation that she submitted to Comcare, who is the authority for Commonwealth employees for claims, which she submitted via the department. Comcare determined that the claim was in favour of Ms Bunter as they considered that the injury had taken place in the course of her employment. Shortly after the Comcare decision was made, the department's human resources manager reviewed the claim and determined that she was not entitled to reimbursement. They advised Comcare that the claim was no longer supported as the injury had occurred solely as a recreational pursuit. The department requested that Comcare's reconsiderations team uh, look at the claim again on the basis that she wasn't at work at the time of the injury. Comcare provided a reviewable decision in favour of Ms Bunter's original claim, relying on their original determination and also case law precedents. The department has now sought a merit review to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal on the basis that Ms Bunter was undertaking activities in a recess from her employment and therefore it was not a workplace injury. They are applying upon case law precedents to support their position. I'll now hand you over to Tony. Thanks, Karen. Um, so we've got some questions on the base based on this um, scenario. Uh, considering her quest situation, does DFAT, who's the Commonwealth body that we're referring to, actually have the right of appeal? And the, as, it, as it's a representative body of the Commonwealth, it's granted the right of review under Section 64B of the Safety, Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 1988, which will hereinafter be referred to the SRC Act because it's too long. Um, that Act says in 64B that if the decision event affects the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth has the right of review. And of course, the Commonwealth is concerned because they have 1.9 million employees, any or all of whom might make similar claims. So I'll go over now and throw to Amanda for the next slide. Thank you, Tony. So question two is, what are the options available to Ms Bunter and what are the powers of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal? For federal employees, Section 6 of the SRC Act applies. It provides a set of circumstances in which an injury to an employee may be considered as a compensable work injury. The original assessment of Ms Bunter's claim and review of a compensable injury resulted in a final determination by Comcare. And this is a reviewable decision as defined both by the AAT Act and the SRC Act a decision able to be reviewed by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. A review by the AAT is undertaken by way of an independent, informal and non-technical review of the factual issues of an administrative decision through a number of preliminary hearings which may allow for a matter to be resolved through alternate dispute resolution prior to being set for hearing. And whilst the application for review is made by the Commonwealth, her employer, Ms Bunter has a right, according to Natural Justice, to protect her interests and legitimate expectations as she has an approved claim for compensation based on the decision by Comcare and has standing pursuant to Section 27 of the AAT Act as a person whose interests are affected by a variation or a revocation of that decision. The AAT has significant powers and is able to consider at a de novo hearing information not available to the original decision maker. It is able to stand in the shoes of that original decision maker to review facts law and policy relating to that decision, including new evidence. And I'll pass over to Megan. Thanks, Amanda. Question three, with the cases cited by DFAT and Comcare, is the AAT bound by these cases and the facts relied upon in the earlier determination of the claims? In common law, there is this notion of the doctrine of precedent. This notion is also carried through to the work of the AAT. Although essentially there is no formal doctrine of precedent that exists in administrative law, members of the AAT will rely upon earlier decisions of the tribunal unless the earlier decision is deemed wrong. This happens majority of the time when the same issue arises in proceedings between the same or similar parties. The tribunal must give written reasons for decisions which include the tribunal's findings of fact together with reference to evidence and other material such as previous cases that may be used as precedent. Overall, the AAT legally is not bound by the decisions made in past cases. However, it may choose to rely upon them. 
In relation to the cases cited by Comcare, the following cases could be relied upon but are not legally obligated to be relied upon when the AAT makes its decision. The cases mentioned in support of Comcare's position were the Commonwealth and Lyon. Lyon, similarly to Miss Bunter, worked for a government agency and broke his thumb playing for the work football team. The tribunal considered the injuries were received in course of his employment the Commonwealth appealed this decision, but the tribunal decision was confirmed. The second case was the Hatsman Nolis case. On the workers' day off, the employer organised a driving excursion for the employees. Uh, on the return journey, the vehicle had flipped. The High Court held that the injury had arisen in the course of the employment because the employer had encouraged the employees to participate in the excursion. This relates back to Miss Bunter's case because her employer also encouraged lunchtime participation in the work team. The following cases were submitted by DFAT to support their defence, Whittingham and Commissioner of Railways and the case of Comcare and PVYW. In Comcare and PVYW, the High Court held that Comcare did not have to um, pay the employee who, while staying overnight on a work-related trip, suffered injuries whilst engaging in sexual intercourse in the motel room her employer had booked her for. In conclusion, although the cases mentioned above do have some reference to the situation between Comcare and DFAT, the AAT is not legally obligated to use them as cases of precedent if they do not wish. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to provide my feedback now. Um, in terms of the presentation, it was well presented. I'm glad that uh, um, I think almost everyone in the group had a chance to actually take part in the presentation. The only concern I have is really in terms of the organization of the content, because uh, it was in the first place in doing the presentation of the factual background, it was actually crucial for the listeners to actually know what the relevant law was that was uh, the basis for the original decision. Um, there was little reference to why the decision was arrived at, except for the statement of the fact that it was treated as a recreational injury as opposed to kind of an injury as, a, as part of the employment. So in that particular case, there should have been a clear citation of what the statutory provision was that governed that subject. And I didn't get that impression what the law really was. So even up to now, I'm not clear what the law is in that regard. Uh, particularly because uh, there was a statement as well that uh, it's in the course of employment, which to me is quite broad. So that is just a, a comment that, um, you know, when you do a presentation, the factual background actually includes the, the statute itself or any law that is the basis of the original decision. Now, the law was cited eventually after, uh, you know, questions were being asked by the group. That should have come at the very start as part of the factual background. Uh, but having said that, um, the organization was, or of the uh, ideas was really good. The content, uh, except for the, for the missing part about the, stat, the statutory provision, was uh, equally of a high distinction level as well as the presentation. Now, having said that, I have a, a few questions which uh, I'd like to ask uh, to the group. The, my, the first question I have is, one of you mentioned that there was a, a, a concern about natural justice. Where does natural justice come in as far as uh, this particular case is concerned? <laughs> Do we have... Um... Do we have anyone answering? Sorry, Manja, my mute wouldn't come off. Amanda here. Um, in relation to natural justice, we are referring to um, that Miss Bunter was not is not the applicant, the making the application for review, and so was not necessarily the party um, going to the administrative appeals tribunal, and so we were um, looking at her claim as that she is that she has a right um, of appearance in that tribunal hearing even though she might not be directly a party in making that application 
wait. So the natural justice here does not relate to the original decision, but actually in relation to any right of Ms. Bunter to appear in the course of the AAT proceedings. Is that it? Yes. That's curious. Do you suppose that's correct? I would have thought that as far as the principles of natural justice are concerned, they should relate to the uh, original decision, not really in terms of uh, appearances at the AAT, because that is based on whether or not the person can actually appear in the course of the AAT proceedings would have to be reliant on the statute and any other uh, practice rules that the AAT uh, may, may enact. How do you understand natural justice anyway? That her uh, rights were of uh, the compensation claim that had already been um, approved could be affected by a change in that decision in the decision. Okay, but I'd, I'd like you to explain for the class what does the principle of natural justice mean, and how does that relate to Miss Bunter's case? Why did that even come up? Oh, it I came would, up because, sorry, Tony, you go. Well, I, I would just suggest as regards the um, incidence of natural justice, this obviously f protects the individual's common law rights. And um, if their common law rights are being uh, threatened, then they have a right to take part in an action. And that's where I believe that natural justice comes into it. Uh, so in relation to the right to be heard, which is a key component of uh, the principle of natural justice. Well, and the right to defend their common law rights, which include um, people not paying them, having agreed to pay them, and, uh, and all other things associated with normal agreements and life. Now, if I remember correctly, actually, the original decision of Comcare was in favor of Ms. Bunter. Isn't that correct? So in that regard, it, it's unlikely to be the case that Ms. Bunter will complain that her right to natural justice was breached by the decision maker. Are you suggesting that her right to natural justice was breached instead by... No, the we're, we're, we're suggesting that she has the right to be heard at the administrative tribunal. Ah. Uh, the Commonwealth is trying to take away or reverse the decision of Comcare. Very so good. So that's, it's not, she's, she's entitled to attend the Comcare decisions, yes. but under normal circumstances, you would not expect her to be, as not being party to the actual thing between the Commonwealth and Comcare, but in fact, it's her rights that are being affected. That's our viewpoint, whether that's open to conjecture and discussion, but that's where we're coming from. Okay, thank you, Tony. Well done. So I'm happy for us to stop at this point because we have one other group which will have to do its presentation in, um, yeah, in less amount of time than, other given was, than was given to others. So thank you uh, very much to Team Cat. You did quite well again uh, tonight, so thank you. So I'd like to uh, give you, the floor Tim. now to the, uh, Army, to the group Army to do its presentation. I just want to confirm, can everybody hear me on the mic? I, I could hear you, yes. Wonderful, thank you. Are you with us, Shane? Okay, since I can't hear that Shane's there, um, I, might, I might grab his part up um, and I might also kick, up, uh, kick off with his part if everybody's okay with that. Is that okay with you there, Liam? Do you, yeah, do you have Shane's part? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to pull it out of the base camp, mate. Just a second. 
All right, great. Okay, sorry about the delay, guys. So our administrative law analysis centers on a man by the name of Mr. Harmer. Uh, Harmer worked as a military equipment inspector in the Australian Army from 1969 through to 1995. Now, Harmer's job required him to repetitively check and undertake maintenance audits on military equipment, weaponry and machinery, some of which would weigh as much as 35 kilos. Now, that's pretty much two bags of cement. So this was before lift assist devices and before safe man manual handling practices were followed or even thought of. It was at a time when you simply had to get the job done without much of a complaint. It was the military after all. And this was Mr. Harmer's work for almost three decades. Now, understandably, all the heavy lifting began to take quite a toll on Mr. Harmer, who was getting on in years, but still carrying out the same physical labor as when he first started. The health of his back began to deteriorate prior to his discharge from the military. Although finding employment outside the military was not hard for Mr. Harmer, it was the persistent back injury that made even the slightest physical challenge um, and movement so challenging for him that uh, it spurred him on a journey through a myriad of otherwise mundane jobs that still managed to cause him severe discomfort. Now, from standing for long periods of time whilst undertaking a traffic control position to merely manning a machine as a donut maker, it seemed that the debilitating after effects of being a military equipment inspector for all those years and injuring his back wouldn't allow him to work in a physical capacity for more than eight hours per week. Now, it's important to note that Mr. Harmer was currently receiving a service pension of 70% of the general rate. He was seeking an increase of this to the special rate pursuant to Section 24 of the Veterans Entitlement Act. In Mr. Harmer's situation, there was two central issues relating to administrative law which need to be considered. The first issue being whether Repatriation Commission made the right decision in denying Mr. Harmer a full pension. And secondly, whether the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which I'll refer to as the AAT, has the authority to change this decision and what grounds, if any, can decide to change the decision on. Now, it's outlined in the Veterans Entitlements Act of 1986 in Section 155A that applicants can be made, uh, applications can be made to the AAT if the applicant is not satisfied with a decision made under the Act. That gives the applicant the opportunity to appeal a decision if they're not satisfied with it. It's similar to digital review in the essence in essence, however, it dishes substantially, as we'll discuss later. It's clear that in this situation, Mr. Harmer was not satisfied with the decision. It's important for justice and equity that he has the opportunity to seek the outcome that he prefers. Now, Mr. Harmer took the liberty of having an independent doctor of his own supply a report to the commission which originally denied his decision. This was Dr. Hadwin. Now, Dr. Hadwin clearly knew of Mr. Harmer's situation, background, and made a careful and considered decision when voicing his opinion that Mr. Harmer's injury um, and voicing his opinion that his ability to undertake remunerative work in the future was severely uh, reduced. The Commission's procedures allowed them to view this report, however, they did not call or cross-examine Dr. Hadwin to gain a further understanding of the opinion. They just read the report itself. The ability and willingness of the AAT to do this is one of the benefits of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal process. Now, the Commission itself is limited in its ability to cross-examine expert witnesses, uh, what evidence is presented, and it has a strict set of guidelines to adhere to when it makes a decision. As taught in administrative law, this is an important feature in these processes to inform a streamlined, cost-effective process. However, in some situations, it does not suit the interest of some applicants. As many law students are aware, when a decision is made regarding a court case, it can only be appealed to a higher court. Decisions made by other bodies, in this case the Repatriation Commission, may be decided by the AAT, as explained above, in a merit reviews process. Now, among other outcomes, the AAT can overturn a decision, change it, or decide that the decision stands. This means the AAT is able to look at situations such as Mr. Harmer's and decide, contrary to the Commission's decision, that the veteran is entitled to the special rate of pension. I'll pass it over to Alana. So section 27 of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act allows a decision to be appealed. This application must generally be made within 28 days of the decision being delivered to the applicant, although the tribunal may extend the time pursuant to section 29, subsection 2, 7. The application for merits review is required to be in writing and must set out the reasons for the application, as well as the decision maker's findings and reasons for the original decision. The Act enables the AAT to affirm, various substitute or set aside an original decision. 
The case of Drake in Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs and later reflected in Section 33 of the AATA originally sets out the principles that the tribunal is not de to determine whether the decision the decision maker made was correct or preferable on the material before them, but whether that decision was correct or preferable on the material before the tribunal. You have which two, minutes, could, two minutes, please. Which could include any new material that had come to light between the first hearing and the appeal. The AATA sets out the three jurisdictional requirements that must be established before the tribunal can review an administrative decision. It states provisions in the Act must allow for the AAT to review any decision made, which was set out in Section 175 of the Veterans Entitlement Act. The applicant must have standing and is a person whose interests are affected, and the decision must be a reviewable decision. The applicant's interests were affected by the original decision and he satisfied this requirement. Based on the Commission's findings, the intermediate pension was likely to be propped up by some form of income, which it was later found that such a job based on the applicant's skills and experience would not exist. As such, the original decision affected the applicant in the fact that he was unable to obtain any such employment and the intermediate rate alone would have been unjust to live off. The AAT strictly used Section 28 of the Veterans Entitlement Act only to come to their decision and it was noted that the professor who made the original report was under the impression that Mr. Harmer had undertaken office and clerical work, although the tribunal found Mr. Harmer was not qualified to undertake any such work, nor would secure such position given his injuries and experience. The tribunal would therefore set the original decision aside, and the applicant received the pension at the special rate with backdated payments. The merits review process allowed the applicant to seek a review of a decision that would have otherwise resulted in a gross injustice. Was that it? That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alana. And thank you, Benjamin. Okay, um, again, I'm very happy with the presentation of the group. In fact, I enjoy listening to the presentations from practically all the groups. So this is uh, one type of assessment which I'm hoping uh, to continue in uh, future courses which I'm handling because it's, uh, it's a very welcome experience to be listening to law students and uh, as they kind of uh, develop their skills of advocacy and uh, presenting ideas. And this is a very good exercise for you. So in terms of the organization, I'm happy with the organization, uh, the way that the ideas were presented. I'm also happy with the presentation itself. I'm very glad that there were, you know, the use of images uh, in terms of the content, the, the only concern I have, again, uh, and I'm hoping this doesn't happen in relation to the future groups, is that there is a very minimal discussion about the relevant law, which had, which had been the basis of the original decision. So there was obviously a decision which went against Mr. Harmer, and that decision was based on a particular law. The law was cited, but not the specific provision of that law, which makes it difficult for us to understand why the decision was against him. So in future, uh, when you make a presentation, you have to make sure that you provide a brief description of the law that had been the basis for the original decision by the decision maker. Now, having said that, I then go to my first question, which is, what exactly was the reason why, on the basis of the law, what was the reason why the decision went against Mr. Harmer? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that one. Can you hear me? Yes, I could. Andrew? Yes, I could. Uh, it, the reason why he lost the first um, appeal is that the doctor said that he was capable of working um, around 16 hours a week, whereas the legislation said if you can't work uh, more than eight, then you get the full pension. What they were saying is that the job that he could work 16 hours a week was four times a week at four hours each day, but he had to inter uh, have intervals of sitting down and standing up. Mm. He also couldn't perform any physical duties, which is against all of his training for the last 30 years, mm. and quite possibly retrain in a job that he'd never done before. And when it came to appeal at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the... Um, they turned around and said, well, that's just ridiculous that you're asking a man in his 60s to completely retrain in something that he doesn't do. We need to go back to Section 29 and say, under the training that he had in the Army, is he, can, can he find a job using those skills to do a, a, a work for at least eight hours a week? 
and they came back and said, with the injuries that he sustained from the army, there is no job he can do with the skills that he learnt in the army um, to work eight hours a week. And that, that's why they gave him the, the special rate. So in relation to the decision of the AAT, was that decision reached on the basis of the facts or on the basis of its interpretation of the law? And they actually looked at different sections. The, the, in his first case um, with the, the commission, they looked at section 24, which was, could he work eight hours a week? And they came back and came up with a, a uh, fairy tale job description and say, yes, he is capable of doing that. When they came to the administrative appeals, um, they looked at only section 28, which talks about with his skills, qualifications and experience, can he reasonably undertake a position with his physical impairment? And mm -hmm. so they looked at two completely different sections. Um, they, they sort of said, well, yes, of course he could work eight hours a week, but he would need to retrain in something that he doesn't know. And it's a bit ridiculous asking him to okay. do that. Perhaps, thank you, Liam. Perhaps my broader question is really this. Uh, we know that if there is an application for review with the AAT, it's uh, meant to be a merits review, looking at the facts. Now, based on what you told me, it suggests that uh, you've, you've suggested that there was some interpretation of the law made by the AAT. So my question is, does it mean, therefore, that if there is a merits review, the AAT can actually rev interpret the law as well? And in that case, would that be impinging upon... Uh, judicial powers, which is loath to allow uh, the uh, interpretation of legal questions by non-federal courts. Yes, Benjamin. Can I, I'll touch on this one quickly, Liam. Um, I think uh, a big part of the merit review process, which went in the reason the decision went in Mr. Harmer's favour, was that they considered that he had done some administrative and clerical work throughout his laborious job as a fitter. Mm. So I think the where the, uh, the administrative law question came in and the fact that the merit reviews process was the correct process is that they looked at that and they looked at the, um, I think they emphasise a lot on the reasonableness of expecting him to go into a purely clerical role. Mm. So I think they considered the fact that he was mostly, he was getting older, he was mostly focused on physical labour and that they couldn't reasonably expect him to do the ben, small ben, clerical... Ben, sorry, sorry to have to cut you off because I'm just aware of that time. My, my, the crux of, of my question really is, is the AAT permitted to interpret the law or is the interpretation of the law something that, exclusive, that is exclusive to federal courts? That is well, my they, yeah, in their decision, they have interpreted the law by looking at Section 28 and looking at his skills and going, we're going to literally take this at what it says. Does he have the physical skills to do it or is, is the permitted? impairment? In other words, my question is, is that permiss permissible given the partial separation of powers uh, in the federal system? In other words, uh, in the Boilermakers case, the court has been, the high court has been quite clear that it wouldn't allow uh, judicial power to be exercised by non-federal courts. So in other words, the interpretation of a law seems to involve the exercise of judicial power. So how, how, would, that be, how would that be possible? So that is my question, meaning the AAT is permitted to interpret the law. Isn't that an encroachment into judicial powers, the power of courts exclusively to interpret the law? I don't know. It, it seems to me that they're actually using the, the legislation and instead of interpreting, they're saying, does he tick these boxes? Um, you know, with the information that we've provided, you know, they're not saying whether or not um, his physical ability is one way or the other. They're, they're actually going through and saying, with his skills, um, will the impairment stop him from, from doing that? And the big thing in here, I guess they are interpreting, is they, they've interpreted might reasonably undertake to say, well, no, it's not fair that he retrains. Mm. Um, so it, that, that would have to be interpreting that. That's what they've done. Okay. So the, is that wrong? Um, you're, you're actually correct. The correct case to cite is actually the case of Brian Lawler Automotive versus Collector of Customs of New South Wales, where the federal court has uh, ruled that the mere fact that a question of law is raised before an administrative tribunal does not divest that administrative tribunal of its power to decide on the case. Now, any interpretation of the law that the administrative tribunal makes is actually provisional, and it is non-binding, obviously, on you know, other parts of the administrative tribunal and certainly not binding on the courts. 
So it is only the federal courts which are which have the power to make final and conclusive decisions on uh, questions of law. But administrative tribunals, obviously, they have to interpret the law in the course of rendering a marriage review decision. But such a the mere fact that they touch upon a legal question does not mean that that uh, decision on the legal question is therefore binding. It's only very provisional and only in relation to that particular case. And it certainly will not divest uh, the administrative tribunal from its power to make a decision, a marriage review decision on the case. So that's the case of Brian Lauder Automotive versus uh, Collective Customs of New South Wales. Well done. Very good. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Army Group did the... Uh, was there any questions or comments? Um, Mange, I just, just one question. And yes, I just please. Missed, uh, Scott. Switch it in quickly. Uh, I've yes. got to go. Um, it's, it's not in relation to this. It's just in relation to the assessment due tomorrow. Um, yes. I see in your email you said that uh, if we've had insufficient responses, we don't have to put that part in. The marks will get uh, appropriated accordingly. Now, do we have to put a written answer to our own question in that MS Word document? Yes. Okay. Because, uh, let me just clarify that. Because actually in the uh, in group discussion assessment, it does say that you need to provide answers to your own discussion questions. So whether yeah. or not there would have been responses or comments from your classmates, you were required from the very beginning, based on the unit profile, to provide answers to your own discussion questions. Now, it, yeah, I just didn't know if that was the answers we provided in the Zoom presentation or you needed the written answers. Oh, I, I needed the written answers to the uh, okay. discussion questions. All right, thank you. So thank you very much. So we've got uh, four excellent uh, presentations by four groups. So I'm very happy with the, with the presentations that have been made so far. And uh, with that, I'd like to end tonight's tutorial session and I congratulate the four groups for doing really well. Uh, Can I just uh, have a quick, quick yes, question? Sorry, yes. Very quickly, when we do this submission tomorrow on the, the questions and answers, you just want one per group again, do you? Yes, just Not one. Not everybody in the group. No, one no, per just group. one. Just one. Okay. No okay. worries. Thank you so much you and uh, good night. See you next time. Bye.